BGU. The late 2000s to early 2010s had loads of cover shooters. Big muscly man game, hitting on aliens, the video game. And who could forget, Eat led the return of Matt Hazard. It's pretty obvious you're not the brains of the operation. Who's in charge? You best be on your way before I make me some pig sushi. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Did I miss something in the script? Is this game set in 1972. If games in that era weren't cover shooters, they at least had cover mechanics, like GTA 4, which is called that because a whole four people actually used the cover system. Now, why am I talking about cover shooters? This should be another video about a character who has the entire game take place in his head. Well, instead, I wanted to talk about one of my favorite bad games, Kane and Lynch 2 Dog Days. <laughs> the fuck? A game so old that I remember buying items for my avatar from the Xbox 360 store. Also, before I jump into the video, feel free to subscribe. Only a small percentage of you are subscribed from this chart I made up in Photoshop. It's totally free, and if you change your mind, please stay subscribed and instead make an angry Twitter thread about how much I fell off. Thank you. Now, I do want to remind you, Ken and Lynch 2 is objectively a bad game. A quick example is me booting up the game, and on the first level, the guy I was supposed to be chasing had his pathfinding broken. So just looked at me angrily while I emptied several hundred 50 cal rounds into his head. <laughs> Not to mention, if you have the game on PC, any secondary monitor will black screen permanently until you tab out or close the game. Reviews at the time ranged from mediocre to one out of 10, Epic fail. Oh my god, you can tell this review was wrote in 2010. Let, let, let Epic 9 gag firing my laser, eh? It's over 9,000. Oh. Everything with this game is just so broken. The gunplay is horrendous with bullets never traveling where you aim. The worst defender being the starting SMGs, which is the equivalent of save scumming a terminal in Fallout 3 until something happens. Meanwhile, the shotguns are basically sniper rifles, being able to travel across continents to dome anyone. If anything, they're probably up there with the Battlefield 3 frag round shotguns before they were nerfed into the abyss. This is my rifle. In that game, pre-patch, if you clicked mouse one anywhere on the map, you'd kill 30 people on a different server with the splash damage. It's actually great looking at these compilations 10 years later and seeing all the dislikes, probably because they were killed the exact same way. They'd go deaf from the explosion, then blind, and then die anyway. Meanwhile, Dog Days has no grenades, replacing them with fuel cans that can be thrown to take out groups of enemies. When you throw a can, the game makes any bullet you fire afterwards instantly home in on the can to blow it up. This feature is actually so generous that the explosive doesn't even have to be on screen for you to detonate it. You can take enemies hostage, but this does literally nothing because enemies don't stop firing and bullets pass right through the hostage into you. And the only weapon you're allowed to equip when you do this is the starting pistol. You can execute them for a finisher that will probably make you partially deaf or throw them. And when this prompt came up, I thought it'd be a kind of sleeping dog style execution, like throwing them off a balcony. But instead, you propel them about three inches. If that isn't bad enough, chances are your AI partner will shoot your hostage anyway, knocking you down to the ground. No. The game also really lacks enemy variety. It's just people with guns. I mean, some people later on have better guns, but there's no change in enemy type or tactics, which is something you don't even really notice because how short the game is, only being four hours long, which means I now get to use the clip of Angry Joe saying that. But all of these are small little nitpicks, and that's why the final verdict for Kane and Lynch 2 is a legendary 10 out of 10. It is fucking badass. And as terrible as this game is, I still love it. The fact it's so broken and shoddy perfectly works in tandem with the world the game's set in. <laughs> and also, that isn't an excuse. The devs definitely didn't make this game bad on purpose. <laughs> Whoa. That is a lot, a lot of lumbosacral flexibility. 
it just hits that line of so bad it's good, especially with the art style. For those wondering why I'm jumping straight into the sequel and not the original, the original, it, it just sucks. Not in a good way, it's just plain bad. Have, have we got to talk about the, the first we, we do? Oh, all right, fine, man. Jesus. Kane and Lynch Dead Men came out in 2007 and was given a giant eh by everyone that played it. If you're wondering why this game looks familiar, it's because it was developed by IO Interactive and published by Eidos, the same companies that worked on Hitman Blood Money, an actually good game that I wish I could talk about right now. The aiming is just as atrocious as the sequel. There's no cover button, so you awkwardly snap into whatever cover you're near. There's not even a reload button, so you have to purposely empty your mag to get a new one. And later in the game, when you manage to get a squad, your dead men, they're just a liability as you have to go and revive them every single time they get downed because any of your remaining squad that try to revive someone usually get mowed down as well. Jeff Gerstmann, an employee for GameSpot, Bigger. did a review saying pretty much everything I just said. Kane and Lynch Dead Men is an ugly, ugly game. And shortly after was fired from GameSpot and years later confirmed that he was actually fired because he didn't score Kane and Lynch high enough citing that he couldn't be trusted. Jeff then went off to start Giant Bomb, so Ken and Lynch is the entire reason Giant Bomb even exists today. Jeff gave the game a 6 out of 10, by the way, which isn't even that bad. Not good. The first game starts off with Kane being sent to death row after being convicted of using ad block on a YouTuber he likes to watch. Mr. Kane, wake up. Mr. Kane, what? Just cover your head now! He's busted out by his old gang called The Seven. You don't need to know who they are. It's not important and they're not in the sequel. They believe that Kane stole all their money and give him three weeks to retrieve it or they'll game end his wife and daughter. Something Breaking Bad would shamelessly steal four years later. I will kill you. Kane is teamed up with Lynch, who basically acts as the Seven's watchdog, making sure that Kane stays in line. The ironic thing is, Lynch is probably as mentally stable as the average subscriber on this channel, having blackouts and killing innocent civilians in paranoid delusions. There's actually a cool feature in the co-op mode where anyone playing as Lynch will have their screen to store and see all the civilians as cops. This would probably make the co-op player kill all the civilians in a delusion, thinking they're protecting themselves, when they could probably just look to the other side of the TV because it was split screen. Then just back off. I'm a little fucking edgy, all right? To be fair, though, that's actually a really good feature. Not something I saw again until Dead Space 3 or Fear 3, where only one character would see something happening on screen. The entire game is pretty much Kane making progress to get the money, only for Lynch to completely mess it up. Oh, Kane robbed a bank and got half the money back already. Time for Lynch to kill everyone they took hostage. Oh, Kane took a crime lord's daughter hostage so they can get the rest of the money. And the crime lord wants to help Kane wipe out the seven. Time for Lynch to accidentally shoot and kill her. I mean, the game has a pretty cool urban setting initially. City streets, the rooftop of a conglomerate Japanese building that I played about 50 times on the Xbox 360 as a demo. But the third act is just copy-paste Cuban jungles, just making it another bland third-person shooter. And honestly, if you really really want to play Ken and Lynch Dead Men because you're a psychopath. It's been removed off Steam indefinitely. You can buy it off the Square Enix store, which I did, but it's essentially unplayable without workarounds because it uses Games for Windows Live. Now, if you don't know what Games for Windows Live is, that's good. Please stop watching the video and enjoy your life not knowing what the ninth circle of hell incarnate was like. Games for Windows Live was essentially a way for people to cross-play from Xbox to PC. I remember using it to play Shadowrun on the Xbox 360. The main feature was to make anyone stop playing their Xbox and buy a PC because how overpowered a mouse was to a controller. But that wasn't the problem. Games for Windows was so broken that it had a 50% chance of totally corrupting your save file to any game you signed up with it. And it would never work without an internet connection, even offline games. And you couldn't even copy your files because they were encrypted in case Microsoft thought you wanted to hack the achievements. Now, after all that, you probably don't want to sign up with games for Windows Live. That's great. I'm happy for you. But now you can't play the game at all. Enjoy. Pretty much every company that wasn't Microsoft hated this DRM. That's why in the remaster of Red Faction Guerrilla, a game all about destroying things, they added a map that had the acronym for games for Windows Live for you to obliterate. Fuck you, Microsoft! So why do I despise Kane and Lynch, but love Kane and Lynch too, despite them being the same game? Well, 
that's the thing. They're really not. Take any two clips of Ken and Lynch dead men and dog days, and you can tell there were huge changes. Not really in gameplay, but visuals. Dog days just looks filthy. It has this amazing visual style I've never seen in a video game, making even Outlast's camcorder look pristine in comparison. It's an ugly game, especially if you consider games like Halo Reach, Red Dead, Poor. Alan Wake, Mass Effect 2, Dead Rising 2, all came out in the same year. But to be fair, in the game's defense, Fallout New Vegas also came out in that year as well. That is one of the best games ever made, but th those graphics... It looks like ass, man. Come on. No one's defending that. You can download 300 shader mods. You cannot fix this. The entire game has this washed out look like it's been filmed on an iPhone after the latest iOS update. Whenever you take damage, the camera glitches out for a second, almost like the footage is corrupting. Lights have an unnatural lens flare, like I'm watching a Hideo Kojima cutscene. Even words from neon signs reflecting onto the camera lens. There's an overuse of chromatic aberration, so everything looks like a Minecraft YouTuber's thumbnail. There's a lot of macro blocking here as well. A video artifact where footage looks like it's made of small squares, as opposed to proper detail and smooth Edges. It all sells that feeling that this is a raw, disgusting world and we're just observing. The game would even freeze unintentionally at certain points, but at the time, I thought it was just part of the aesthetic, like the footage itself had become corrupted over time. The muzzle flash from fired guns distorts the screen and huge barreling LMGs you get later on in the game can literally deafen you as the audio software and the camcorder can't pick up the sounds with such high decibels. When you run, the camera shakes to a nauseating degree, almost like you're being followed by a real cameraman. You can disable shaky cam in the options, but it just makes the game feel a lot more static and safe. It goes from something unique to a more conventional and boring cover shooter. One thing you can't disable is any of the camera effects. They're literally baked into the game. When you hit checkpoints, it shows how long the tape's been recording, and when you die, the camera drops to the ground as if the cameraman himself literally got capped. We're watching found footage. Footage that's already been edited by the fact scoring headshots will sometimes blur out the person's entire face as not to unsettle the audience back home, or at least until they add a live leak logo in the corner. The genius part is headshots in the game aren't even that gory. It's not like pieces of brain are being splattered. It's just a simple entry wound that will sometimes randomly have the blur kick in, implying the death was much more gruesome than it actually was. Loading screens don't load, they buffer the next recording. And the screens themselves display previews of what the camera had already captured that day. Almost like the thumbnail of a YouTube video. You'll hear Ken and Lynch talking about their next move while GSM interference plays in the background. It's me. Call me back. I fucked up bad. We gotta get out of the city. Disappear. The game has no real soundtrack apart from these invasive, oppressive sounds that could honestly fit into the other world in a Silent Hill game. Only to be completely contrasted by upbeat Chinese music that almost parodies how grim the game can be sometimes. <laughs> Dog Days takes place entirely in Shanghai, China's biggest city and global financial hub. Was that Beijing? Like any major city, it's beautiful as it is seedy. The perfect setting for these two horrible characters to meet up. The main menu screens consist of various shots of Shanghai as handheld footage films whatever's happening. A plane taking off, the freeway with Chinese music playing from the car's radio, even a hotel room with a noise complaint nearby. It's something you'd see on a YouTube channel in 2010 with about five views, but that's the point. It emulates that found footage aesthetic perfectly. Akan Abrak, CEO of IO Interactive, said he wanted Ken and Lynch 2 to pursue realism more than the first game. saying the team was inspired by Mark Man movies like Heat, a film about heists and public shootouts with police, with the Blair Witch and early YouTube being the inspiration for the handheld camera aesthetic. It's some guy just checking out his mobile phone and recording something that's happening, something weird or interesting. Kane and Lynch 2 does mention what happened the previous game, but it doesn't make it its foundation. How's your daughter? <laughs> she's fine. I mean, after what you went through, I said I... she's fine, okay? Don't start fucking around. Okay, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. 
And that's it. The only mention of the previous game is an offhand attempt of Lynch trying to small talk to Kane and him not want to go on about it. Almost self-aware to how panned the original game was. Jenny was Kane's surviving daughter in the first game, her mum. Kane's wife was killed by the Seven, but Jenny survives. In the climax of the game, you have the choice to save your squad from what's left of the Seven's mercenaries or leave everyone behind to save Jenny. Both of these endings have terrible outcomes. If you leave with Jenny, she calls you a traitor, abandoning your squad to save yourself. All while Lynch looks on in disgust. If you do try to save your squad, one of them is already dead and the other has nothing but resentment towards you. He then tries to escape on his own and gets blown up. Only then for your daughter who's been following you all along to get shot. Barely escaping on the boat with a comatose daughter, Lynch tells you that you should have taken that chopper. Ah! You should have taken that chopper. And that was Jenny's only real chance at surviving. The paradox being whatever ending you pick, you feel like you should have picked the other one. I fucking knew it. From the first second, I fucking knew it. In Dog Days, both of these endings are possible with this small exchange they have. Lynch either learned to move on from his resentment of being abandoned, or Jenny somehow made a kind of recovery after being shot. Dog Days acknowledges the first game, but that's where the references end. Instead of playing Kane like the first game, you play as Lynch, with the co-op character being Kane. The first game was about Kane getting revenge and Lynch just being in it for the ride, eventually himself being betrayed by the Seven and having to team up with Kane to get revenge. Lynch Lynch is much more settled in the sequel. His schizophrenia isn't as prominent and he has permanent residency in Shanghai. The only reason they've met up again is because of an arms deal that could make both of them a lot of money, with Kane flying in from America, which from the intro alone, you could tell didn't go to plan. Lynch! Don't fucking kill you! Dog Days is a depressing game. Murphy's Law is an adage, simply put, anything that can go wrong will definitely go wrong. And that is this game summed up perfectly. These are two horrible men who, through some form of karma or divine intervention, find everything around them crumbling, even though they're trying to make some kind of amends. Halfway through the game, they become self-aware, knowing that they're the catalyst for all the pain and suffering around them. Why do people always die around us? At least you got Jenny. She doesn't want to. I haven't spoken to her since Venezuela. <laughs> One last shout. Get some money, settle down, she forgive me. The thing is, it's always one last job with these two characters. One last job to make that money, but these are two people who will never be happy. Kane will always be chasing the affection of his surviving family. Settle down, she forgive me. And Lynch will be struggling with his mental illness and outbursts. It's not... There's no scene in Dog Days where Lynch loses it entirely and guns down innocent civilians. That co-op clip seems almost comedic in comparison. But during combat, you can hear him slowly break down, trying to suppress his mental illness before it gets the better of him. You're in control. This is easy. You're the fucking man. The entirety of Dog Days takes place over a couple of days, with most levels starting seconds after the previous level finishes, even being able to see the background of the previous level just in view. There's no shop in between levels to buy gear, you just take whatever you scavenged in the previous level. This all helps sell the idea that this gauntlet really doesn't end until the camera stops filming, and any downtime they do manage to find themselves in is quickly interrupted. Shit! What? What the fuck? Gameplay starting seamlessly, not even being able to relax during a loading screen. This game is so visceral, so intense in your face that you're gonna be left without any skin left. Without any skin left. The game begins with Lynch wanting to do a detour before the arms deal. He wants to teach someone a lesson who's been talking too much. A pretty terrible excuse to not set up the arms deal, which the game itself is self-aware about. So when we're done playing gangster, I want to go to my hotel. Yeah, sure. Going into the room, you're attacked by the guy Lynch wanted to talk to. Now, most people would cut their losses and realize that it's way more trouble than it's worth, but this is Lynch. Someone as mentally unstable as, well, a video game character. So forces Kane to push on getting the guy. Even giving him a spare Desert Eagle, he has just in case. Here, take this! 
kidding. Just in case. It's like an early 2000s B movie full of plot holes and contradictions, but you don't question it because it's a video game and now you get to shoot stuff. You chase the guy through other people's apartments, rooftops, back alleys, vendor stores, where eventually you meet resistance from the guy you're chasing, spamming every pre-order bonus he can to slow you down in the form of hordes of gang members. A few at first, but then cars full of them pouring out just to give some space between you and the guy you're chasing. And when you eventually confront him, he takes the girl hostage. There's an exchange of gunfire, the cameraman seemingly stumbling over so you can't make out who shot who, but the girl falls to her death, while the man you've been chasing cuts his own throat. Hey, relax. Nothing really makes sense. You've shot up a good couple kilometers of Shanghai or from an unnamed man to finish himself off anyway. And as you can see, every single player has a device strapped to them that when they're eliminated, it pops. At the minute, Ken and Lynch are both blissfully unaware of what happened. But when they do, it'll totally make sense as to why the man chose to game end himself instead of facing the consequences. Glazer, it's Lynch. Yeah, he's here. You'll take us to the docks now? All right, great. All right, you pick us up in 20? Okay, I'll see you soon. Once you get the car, go to Africa. You'll get paid. Chapter 2 starts being filmed in the back of the car like it's some sting in a JCS video, with Kane and Lynch being picked up by their contact, Glazer. Glazer is someone who fits perfectly into this game's rendition of Shanghai. He's corrupt, petty, and looks like Michael Kane if you rendered him on a PlayStation 2 engine. So, how do you like Shanghai, Kane? It's fucked. I hate it. Yeah, I love it too. You know you can get your hair washed and a shag for 51. <laughs> That'd be brilliant. Now I'll take you out some time. This town was built for people like us. Glazer is someone who revels in how broken Shanghai is. He's not someone that wants to do one last job like Kane. He's fairly older than the two and has been in the game longer and has no intention of leaving. He's found his place and he's happy where he is. Glazer is voiced by Jason Connery that, I'm not even joking here, is the son of Sean Connery who played James Bond in the 60s and 80s. There's something beautifully ironic how different the roles are. A double O agent that travels the world saving lives and a scummy gun runner that can only talk about getting paid sex in his downtime. Your group is quickly attacked on the freeway, seemingly by the same gang that jumped you in the previous mission. All you can do now is protect Glazer's limo, because if you lose him, you lose the arms deal and your only point being in China. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> Something the game is incredibly self-aware about. The limo will slowly roll up on the street, but taking cover behind it is probably the worst idea because the limo will take damage faster than having an opinion in the YouTube comments. It's a chaotic fight. Gangsters pulling up in cars to push you with MAC-10s and Scorpions. The traffic on the other side of the road seemingly acting normal as if to not grab the attention of the firefight. All while civilians try to run away from the carnage or just sit in their car too terrified to move, hoping that if they stay still enough, they won't catch a stray bullet. My favorite part is when two bikers skid off their bikes and instead of being knocked over for a second you're instantly killed as your kneecaps teleport to a different quantum reality at one point even glazer's limo in a scripted scene is knocked over by a lorry and you have to help him out it feels raw and frantic you're not the master chief helping thwart the covenant with your gorse cannon warthog you're barely scraping by, almost like you're a bystander in this game. One detail I love is how you have to help drag Glazer out of the limo and all three of you stumble away from the crash. The driver, who was totally unmentioned, has to crawl out entirely on his own with no option or prompt for you to pull him out. It shows how like openly selfish all of these characters are, like the driver was just another replaceable NPC. Eventually, the gang members are slowly replaced by cops responding to the gunfire. Picking up their weapons is a huge upgrade to the imported SMG and pistols the gang had, being replaced with semi-auto shotguns and high-precision revolvers. Being able to score a headshot when not in point-blank range is a blessing in this game, so it's always important to hoard long-range firearms. The fuck just happened? I don't know. You! Shut it! Get that bloody door open! We're gonna have a sodding heart attack! Getting inside a garage, Glazer can call one of his seemingly endless contacts to get a pickup to escape the area. And I think this interaction perfectly encapsulates Glazer as a character. Good idea. 
Finally, I'm getting my money's worth. You, what's the bloody number? Hello? Yes, me. We're in a, in a situation. I need a pickup. Yeah, yeah. Well, then, I don't fucking care if your mum's got fucking head cancer. The fact this model has a permanent Bluetooth earpiece in, something that was popular in the late 2000s, but seems almost ancient by today's standards. Also to note, there were like so many characters in media that were complete assholes that had Bluetooth earpieces in. I mean, for an example, even Breaking Bad had one. Stacy's a cow. We're talking major barnyard boo hog. We got a Breaking Bad reference in. I'm so happy, boys. This is also the first mention we have of Sing, someone Glazer and Lynch are almost accustomed to. The pickup is on the way. We gotta hurry. This is Sting territory. Sing! You're fucking kidding! This is someone Glazer is deeply afraid of. His shouty bravado from earlier is reduced to almost whispering as he slowly comes to the realization of who's placed to hit on him. This is not bloody heaven. Not now. Fuck it. Our deal was perfectly planned. Fuck it. Fighting past more cups and even some K9 units. These ones don't initiate a quick time event like Call of Duty, by the way. What the they just instant kill what you. The Glazer and Lynch then give a bit more insight to who Sing is. You have to tell me who this guy Sing is. He's trouble. Drugs, prostitution, you name it. Nothing is beneath this cocksucker. And he's a genius with a knife, if you know what I mean. Used to do business with him way back when the chinks still worship Western currency. I love during that conversation, half the lip movement doesn't even trigger, and you have to stand completely still because if you move, there's a chance the dialogue just wouldn't load. Again, AAA gaming is flawless. Sing is someone Glazer has dealt with, but doesn't want to. And keep in mind, Glazer is scum. So for him to be afraid of someone in Shanghai, that means they're really not a good character. I love how the roles are reversed here. I know you're playing as Lynch instead of Kane, but first game, Kane was teaching Lynch about how the world worked, but China is totally alien to Kane. So now Lynch has to do the world building for him. You can even cut off the dialogue early by kicking a door down, which reveals the next area you're fighting in. Drugs, prostitution, you name it. Nothing. Oh, 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 careful, mate. I think it's perfectly symbolic, and I'm definitely, definitely giving the game too much credit here. But you can never just peek a door like in most games. You have to aggressively kick them open. This is across the whole game, and it never changes. Oh, oh. This little event of Lynch nearly losing his life because of him being too aggressive and yet still kicking every single door down he comes across in the game, to me at least, shows that him and Kane cannot change as people. Also, if you really want to, you can just jump out the doorway and instantly die where the cameraman follows you and he dies as well. After clearing out the remaining cops by spamming around 20 misplaced gas canisters, you escape into the getaway van where all of you are just as confused as to why anyone would place a hit on Glazer. Right? Got it? So you listen. You lot, you go talk to Sing. Find out anything you can. I'm running a little late, but we ran into some trouble. We'll just meet at the restaurant. After Sing's hit, Lynch and Kane are tasked with finding out why Sing wanted to hit Glazer in the first place. This is probably the only mission in the game that's somewhat similar to the original title. The first game was subtitled Dead Men because Kane was betrayed and he broke into a prison to rescue his dead men. People who'd been marked by the Seven and helped Kane because all they wanted to do was get revenge. This is the only level in the game where you get friendly AI to cover you. The original had squad mechanics like sending them to places or choosing what guns they had, but there's none of that here. It's much more stripped down. Pretty much, you just help the people that aren't shooting you, hoping you can score some kills before they get shot themselves. Don't worry. We'll see you later, Glazer. You might work it hostile, so only shoot if they shoot. You start off with Tommy. I have no idea who he is. The game subtitle calls him Tommy, and Kane and Lynch call him Tommy when he gets killed. Ah! Ah, Kane, get ah. back! Ah, oh, shit. He shot Tommy. By the way, I actually tried to save Tommy, but the guy that one taps him is purposely out of view. So even if you angle yourself to shoot him, he's completely invincible until he kills Tommy. After which he dies in a single shot. Get what the fuck? From the beginning of the game, Kane bringing his tiny luggage case, thinking this will just be a small job to get some money back home. Time moves forward and nothing changes. But how far we've come, we know that that isn't the case anymore. And Kane confronts Lynch about how deep the rabbit hole goes. This is a goddamn gang war. Shh. 
keep it down. Sing might have some kind of beef with us, okay? We just gotta find out why. Well, I don't like it. Don't worry. Everything will work out fine. You'll be on that boat in a couple of days. There's too many secrets, Lynch. Too much bullshit. Yeah. Welcome to Shanghai. Kane is voiced by Brian Bloom. You might have heard his voice in other titles like Varric Tethrus and Dragon Age and BJ Blazkowicz in Wolfenstein. He even voices Nick Rays in Call of Duty Infinite Warfare. Although no one really cares about that game except for the robot. Let's be real. I, I'm very sad. He's also been a long time writer for Call of Duty Modern Warfare, which is the most successful COD entry to date. And I know Call of Duty is a series that people meme on, which is, you know, for good reason. Currently on Warzone, I'm running the Scream character, jump sliding around, hoping I jump scare someone. But the guy has a pretty large portfolio and knows how to emulate a complete piece of shit mercenary. Lynch is voiced by Jerry and Monroe. There's not too much info on him apart from minor supporting roles. I am C2N2. But he did voice Dr. Kaufman in the original Silent Hill game. And I think it's perfectly fitting that Lynch, a paranoid shit. pathological liar, shit. Shit. is voiced by a guy that in Silent Hill was a paranoid pathological liar. Their alliance is fragile. Not that they'll kill each other the first chance they get, but more how they deeply dislike each other, but have an acknowledgement that if one abandons the other, they half their chances of survival. Move! Move! Lynch! Meet you down the car yard on your right! Thank God. Thought we'd never see you guys. The next gunfight is the most brutal. Even though you have the support with Glazer's group, it just means you're pitted against more enemies. Your teammates will randomly get headshot with the cameraman trying to blur out the footage so it doesn't get demonetized. It feels relentless and the stress is getting to Lynch, forcing him to mumble incoherent nonsense to cope. I like this. I mean, sure, you can chalk it up to mumble rapping. What'd you say? But this is miles above seeing civilians as cops in the first game. This is someone who's having a complete breakdown and is trying their hardest to contain it through screaming and shouting, almost as a form of catharsis in the middle of a gunfight. Throughout the game, Lynch will have these moments that the game doesn't even subtitle. Many freakouts and breakdowns like he's just about to snap. It's incredibly human, but just before he goes overboard and does something stupid, Kane manages to leash him back into control. It's much more subtle than the hallucinations from the first game and makes their relationship feel more genuine, even if they're both completely despicable. The plan now with you and Glazer's squad is to confront Singh, Lynch fully aware of how large your group is. What's the plan now? We go and talk to Singh. Make it sound easy. Now that we're hooked up with the others, we're unstoppable. I mean, you are unstoppable. The rest of the gang has no match against you. And with a squad of AI teammates, the map becomes so overcrowded, you're even given choices to divert away from Glazer's squad just to give the enemy AI a fair chance. The funny thing is about Glazer's squad, you'll probably recognize the majority of their voices. That's because pretty much all of them are voiced by Robin Atkin Downs, but you probably know him as the medic in Team Fortress 2. Medic gaming! He does a variety of accents here, British, Scottish, <laughs> Irish. Filthy fucking animal. I mean, they could have just hired more actors. I've got nothing wrong with this guy. He does a great job, but it, it's like having every character voiced by Nolan North. So fuzzy. You push past the workshops into the sleeping quarters where the group is so large, they end up clipping into each other. Almost like the game, you know, wasn't designed for this many friendly AI. I don't know how many men Singh's got guarding him. Eventually, you find Singh and confront him. During my playthrough, I loaded my gun thinking it'd be a shootout with Singh. It was anything but. You, beat it. Mr. Singh, I'm Lynch. I know who you are. Tell me about the hit on the freeway. You listen to me. I'm not gonna get anything out of him. Like no, that. back off. This is what I do. You're coming with us. You think you big man or oh, big man, eh? Shooting girl. What are you talking about? <laughs> you stupid man. You shoot wrong girl. What girl? Girl in market. Shang Su's daughter. No, that couldn't be. Song Su is more happy. He will kill every one of you. You wanker, Lich. All this because of you? This I'll changes tell everything. I'll about your loyalty. But you two, 
Ah, ah. Shit. Get back inside! Fuck! You've been betrayed, but honestly, you did it to yourself. The random guy you chased in the first chapter, Lynch quoted as teaching him a lesson, had major consequences. The girl that was shot by either of you two was the daughter of someone powerful, someone higher up than Singh. Singh was played up as this huge villain you take down, but he was just a bit player. His real employer is Shang Si. We're not sure who he is yet, but the fact Singh can stand up on his own to affirm dominance and Glazer's squad pretty much instantly turn on you shows that this is a terrifying character. That's why the guy in the beginning killed himself and why you're pretty much fucked. Suddenly you're put against Glazer's men who have all turned against you. So much suppressive fire that you couldn't possibly kill any of them through the smoke. Moving upstairs past the broken windows, they call for a pickup, a minivan that you have to shoot until everyone inside dies, banking on the hope that Glazer doesn't find out because if any of them make it and snitch to him, He'll most likely turn on you as well. Lay low. Pray the glazer doesn't find out. This is serious. Singh and his men retreat while the local police storm in. Again, probably for the gunshots. And when you push them back and escape, Lynch finally gives some insight to how bad Shang Si is. Looks like Singh's moved up in the world. Working for Shang Si. Who? Shang Si! Literally means big boss. And we shot his goddamn daughter. The girl with Brady! <laughs> I love that little chuckle he lets out, almost as acknowledgement for how fucked him and Kane are. <laughs> Lynch calls his girlfriend Zoo as soon as the coast is clear. Lynch, what have you gotten me into? Oh, man, I'm trying to think. I gotta call Sue. Put that away! Who is Shang Si? Tibet government official. The most dangerous type in the whole of fucking China. Shit, I can't stay here. Lynch, will this affect the deal? No, not if we keep low. Damn, Kane. I can't stand. He can't find us. He can't find us. Lynch knows he's lying to buy time. His entire life is crumbling. Him and his girlfriend aren't safe. He just doesn't want Kane to know that yet in case he abandons him as well. You can't say that China is a safe place while also saying an arms deal is going to go down without a hitch. The next loading screen is Lynch calling his girlfriend, telling her that she's not safe. Sue, call me back. I fucked up bad. We gotta get out of the city. The Xuanzi is the restaurant that Lynch organized the three to eat at the start of the game. Almost as if Lynch is trying to call back to a time before shooting a corrupt government official's daughter and having a small army of gang members attack him. But that time has long come and gone. What? What the fuck? I love the uncertainty of who actually killed Shang Si's daughter. It went from Lynch blaming Kane entirely to him now taking partial responsibility for it. I wasn't the only one who put a bullet in that girl. The people attacking you here are entirely different to the gangbangers you've encountered before. They're cops. A trained kill squad sent personally for you carrying suppressed bullpup submachine guns. Either paid off by Shang Si or tricked into thinking you're a terrorist threat. The entire restaurant falls apart. Lights shattering, the shoddy wooden walls can't stand against the suppressive gunfire. This is one of the few environments in the game that has that Battlefield Bad Company 2 level of destruction. Come on, let's get going. Yeah. Yeah. Shit, Lynch. How did the cops find us? Don't know. Gotta get the suit. You think that's a good idea? She never turned up. I love how he turns back to his neutral pose here. Like, this is the only budget they gave AI Kane throughout the whole game. That and pulling an SMG off a guy earlier. Before leaving, if you listen, you can even hear radio chatter in between forces converging on you, almost reminding me of the civil protection from Half-Life 2. Before leaving, you find the storage room where they've taken all of the kitchen staff hostage. Jesus Christ. People tied up. What kind of police are they? Not my concern. Let's go. After what Lynch says, you have no option to free them. You can kill them if you want, but surely this doesn't make you any better than the people who just jumped you. Lynch and Kane lurk the back streets, trying to avoid any kind of police. Kane even questions if Glazer is onto them, which Lynch responds in complete silence. Nearby, you can find, unironically, the most contempt man in any video game ever. 
You can literally draw a gun on him and he just slowly walks away, knowing that if you pull the trigger, he's had a valuable life. We all strive to be this man. Lynch wants to go to Zhu's apartment to evacuate her as soon as possible, knowing any tension he has with shang -Xi will come straight onto her. She'll just be a tool to hurt Lynch. You see some patrol cops interrogating locals until you interrupt. And after, all that's left is a single cop who surrenders to you, dropping his gun. This is the only cop that surrenders in the entire game. The genius thing is, if your partner in game is AI, he'll just gun down the cop regardless. The only reason I'm talking about this is because it reveals that he had an exact replica of the gun he just surrendered to you. I'm sure this was an oversight, like a sidearm, I'd understand, but an exact copy of the gun he just had. Getting onto a crowded main street, this is one of the few instances where you see civilians acting casual before a gunfight. It's almost like there's a sense of normalcy before everything kicks off. People getting out of their cars, locking up shops for the evening. It seems almost peaceful. That is until I walk past a specific trigger line, making everyone suddenly shit themselves and run away even though there was nothing behind me and no one seemed to care that I had a gun in my hand up until now. Eventually the police show up and I think this interaction is the most dog days moment in the entire game. I shot one of the cops who started bleeding out. A random civilian ran through his head, clipping into him, and then the cop just ragdolls. There's so many cops, they've practically replaced all the civilians pouring out into the streets. There's some classic video game explodey barrels inside a store. Instinct would tell you to shoot them, and when you do, this happens. Oh, God. I love how the explosion is so strong, it artifacts the camera footage and even corrupts the audio. It's a great effect that reminds you everything is being recorded. There's even a DVD shop opposite the store where you can find a copy of Hitman Blood Money. Also, off note, but does anyone remember like DVD stores being a thing? I mean, they still are, but looking online, there's only about 300 million DVDs expected to be sold this year, as opposed to the 2 billion sold leading up to 2010, the year this game came out. A lot of games I play are usually in a fictional fantasy setting that's timeless, but Dog Days, you really do feel like you're trapped in an era of the late 2000s. And the fact I talk about the late 2000s like it was ages ago is truly terrifying. Finally, escaping the streets, you get to an open construction yard. The few parts of Shanghai that aren't dense and overcrowded. You can see the high-rise towers, the trading hubs, leaning over the overcrowded suburbs, dotted with neon advertising. Honestly, as ugly as the game tends to be, scenes like this are beautiful. Usually when you're in the streets, you'll have cars blockading areas you're not meant to go to. And you can see off in the distance, the streets are just a literal JPEG of the city to save resources. But again, there's something beautiful about this simplicity. It reminds me of that time when I was playing Ravenholm in Half-Life 2. The trees and sky off in the distance were just a literal box that you could shoot at. Basically, what I'm saying is the game was so dated that you could put bullet holes into the sky. The next segment never made much sense to me, even now. After gunning down some riot police before reaching Zoo's apartment, there's a final confrontation with some snipers. And Kane gives the hint that you can sneak past them. Right there. That's your apartment. Get down! Shit! We can sneak by them. Don't do anything irrational. Now, I've played this part about 10 times, and I do want to say, you can never sneak past them. I thought I could just wait for them to pass by, but it seems after a certain trigger line, the enemies walk over. They just instantly know where you are. I thought, okay, if the game wants me to play stealthy, how about I try and shoot the lights out with my silenced SMG? Nope, they hear that and spot me instantly. I even tried actively sneaking past them, and when I go past the trigger line that they do, they... Again, know where I am. Keep in mind, this is the only time in the game where stealth is hinted at as a mechanic. It's almost like this was some part that the devs wanted to expand on, but just never did. Even in co-op, me and a friend waited at the very start of the area, but after a specific trigger, they just become omnipresent and know where we are. Yep, they just instantly wow. knew where we were. Sue? Oh, Glazer. No, no, it's just expecting Sue to... What do you mean trying to hide? No, we're cool. Okay, the deal's tomorrow. Getting to Zoo's apartment, there's a gang that's already arrived waiting for you. Working your way upstairs, you have to separate from Kane. I remember this being used sometimes in Gears of War and, you know, other co-op games, where you're separated from your partner for a brief section of gameplay. In reality, all it really does is make the game harder, because if one of you dies, you can't revive the other, so you both die. That would be the case, but here in single player, if you die, it's an instant game over, so it changes nothing. Also, the fact that your AI partner is completely invincible, able to eat several hundred pounds of lead, only to fall over, 
and take absolutely no damage and never need to be revived. When they reach Zoo's apartment, the door is already broken down. Zoo! Where are you? Zoo! God damn it! We gotta go. Leave the country. This, 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 this fucking shang -Chi, whatever the fuck he owns the police, he owns Sing. We are way over our heads here. No, I'm not going anywhere without Zoo! She can't be far! Listen to me, Lynch. If you love this woman, you stay the fuck away. Uh, this is not happening! After the cutscene, you get knocked to the floor by a squad sent to kill you. I assume you're knocked down so they can spawn in. Like, not even joking, I'm going through this footage frame by frame, and you can see the exact millisecond that they all suddenly appear, using the same bullpup SMGs the SWAT team used. It's pretty much confirmation that the cops are on shang -Chi's payroll. You'll eventually find Zhu, who's made her way to the opposite balcony. You'll have to kill anyone that tries to get near and kidnap her. Alternatively, you could just watch her get yoinked, and she falls off, which leads to her instantly ragdolling and bouncing on the concrete. No! 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 Every time you're about to rescue her, she gets jumped by more gang members, until Sing himself shows up and has Zhu hostage. Kane reckons he can get a shot at Sing, but surrounded, Lynch does the only thing he can think of. Tell him to let her go. Trust me. Kane, I'm sorry. I laughed at this originally. There are so many games where it takes 50 rounds to kill someone, but in a cutscene, they die in a single shot. But here, it actually felt kind of realistic to the game. If the cutscene ended and we had to shoot our way out, and with how close enemies are, I can't actually guarantee that I would have made it out alive. Get the fuck off of me! Don't! Don't let them hurt me! Please, Lynch, make him stop. Betray her. No! Leave her alone! I said leave her alone! Tell him to stop! Please! The loading screen for this chapter is probably the most unsettling in the entire game. When Lynch wakes up, he's covered in cuts, bleeding in a dumpster, and completely naked. Thankfully, the cameraman actually senses out the genitals, so, you know, I can get paid for making this video. You need to follow Kane's screams to find him, and when you do, you can get the jump on Sing and kill him. There's no boss fight, quick time event, or hordes of enemies. You just quickly tackle him to the ground and choke him out. Both of you are alive, but it's too late for Zoo, who was brutally murdered by Sing, which calls back to what Glazer said earlier. And he's a genius with a knife. If you know what I mean. Also, I'm not sure if this is a bug or not, but Zoo still blinks if you uh, look down at her body. Lynch doesn't want to talk about Zoo. He just wants to do the gun deal and get out of China with Kane. He's lost everything, and his only reason to stay has been pulled away from him. There's no cutscene of Kane consoling Lynch or making sure he's okay. There's too much going on too quickly for a sit down like that to happen. Instead, this is pretty much the only time it's acknowledged. No! This is when Lynch's mental illness gets the better of him. He's been worn down and broken, and doesn't have the mental aptitude like Kane to just block everything out. And this exchange during a gunfight is really telling that he's losing it. Lynch! Don't lose it! Oh, shit! I don't fucking care! I'm fucking naked! I have people screaming, shooting, scary! You gotta keep going! But hey, at least one guy dropped the Desert Eagle we used in the very first level. And this is the only time we'll ever see it ever again. The ironic part about this game is in Dead Men, Kane was the one dragging Lynch into his own personal hell, beefing with the Seven. Lynch was just a watchdog. But now the roles are reversed, with Lynch being the instigator. It really doesn't matter who shot shang -Chi's daughter. It was Lynch who wanted to push the guy and teach the gang a lesson. Kane just wanted to go back to his hotel. This culminates with Lynch having a mental breakdown and Kane having to console him. <laughs> Fuck! Lynch, I need you to calm down. Oh, go fuck yourself, Kane! Fuck off home! That's what you want! They killed Sue! Look, I'm sorry, okay? We can get out of here. They ain't gonna fucking get away with this. Yes, they are. Dead don't care. Believe me. I know. Look, I want out. But I need this deal. I need 
to do this with my daughter. And then no more. This is my last job. Then fucking go! Lynch, shang is not gonna stop. Now we need to be on that boat. And I ain't leaving empty-handed. Not now. This is all I got. And I need your help. Are you with me? It's weird for a video game to have your AI partner be the one to take control. We've all played as anti-heroes in video games, but at the minute, you're playing as a helpless schizophrenic having a complete crisis while an NPC is telling you to take control. After all this though, Kane is still being greedy. He doesn't want to just escape China, he still wants to do the arms deal with Glazer, saying that he's doing it for his daughter, and again that mention of one last job. But we've already gone over how it'll never be one last job. If Lynch is chaotic neutral, Kane would be neutral evil. Neither are good people, but Lynch at least has the excuse of being seriously mentally ill. Kane has no excuse. He could leave right now and try to escape Shanghai, but he always just wants more money and is manipulating Lynch into helping him get that. I can't wear this. Just put it on. The deal's in an hour. I'm not losing this. Don't worry. You won't. We'll be safe soon. Getting some clothes on in between missions, Kane and Lynch eventually make their way to Glazer's deal. The only reason to even stay in Shanghai. And again, applying Murphy's Law, the deal goes about as well as anything else has the past couple days. Lynchy! Hey! Am I glad you made it? Ready to make some money? Yeah. No! Both of them! Bloody morals! What? Shut it! I could. But why do we even bother? You bloody retard! You know the shit I've gone through in the last couple of days. No! Because you're fucking idiots! Because of you, I have got nothing! You make me sick. I settled my score with Shanks. No, Lynch! You prick! You lost a tick tart! You settled back of all! Just throw them on the dump and you're done. Glazer betrayed you, or at least knows that siding with you is a death sentence for him and his crew. Glazer has a small personal army, but it's nothing compared to all the gangs and corrupt police forces in China. You could tell something was up when he called Lynch when he was on his way to check on Zhu. Zhu? Oh, Glazer. He wanted to know where Lynch was so he could kill him and bring his body to shang -Chi. When you were being attacked on the highway, they were never actually going after Glazer and his limo. They were only going after you. Glazer was just stuck in the middle and wanted the fastest way out. He talks about shang -Chi's daughter with no respect whatsoever. He has no allegiance to him. He just knows that he has a higher chance of survival if he works for him. Half of this level consists of chasing down Glazer while you deal with his personal army. The same people you were working with a couple missions ago. You wipe out most of them in the first part of the level. A Fight, you really shouldn't have survived because they were ready for you. Something Lynch is fully aware of, almost laughing at how he's not dead yet. <laughs> I don't believe he did that. Selling us out. No pay. No worry. You can come across a small group of dock workers that have been killed by Glazer's men. Ironically, Lynch calls them animals for killing unarmed people. But you can do the exact same thing in the game earlier with no reaction whatsoever. You can see this as an oversight or read more into it on how fucked these characters' morals are. Possibly killing countless civilians with no commentary, but thinking they have the right to judge other people doing the same thing. Eventually, you whittle down Glazer's forces. Ironically, the last person you kill before getting to him is the driver you saw in the second chapter. After which you confront him, Lynch says the best line in the game and probably the best line in any video game ever. You little British shit. He does the typical coward trope of wanting to worm his way out. We were just friends and he had no choice. I had no choice. You would have done the same thing. You'd have done the same thing. You know, all the stuff that games usually do only for the character to try and kill you when you get close. <laughs> 
But instead, Glazer offers a way out, a plane they can escape China on. You can leave the country. Uh, uh, yeah. You're about. I got, I got a plane. What the hell? Instead of the chapter ending as it should do, it just keeps going. It keeps filming. You're only halfway done and Glazer was the full guy. Used his bait knowing he'd still come to the deal. shang -Chi didn't care if Glazer survived or not. He just wants Kane, Lynch, and everyone associated with them dead. Instead of fighting patrol cops in SWAT, you're now up against the Chinese army. That's not hyperbole. It is the literal Chinese army. With shang -Chi being a government official, he has the ability to do this. Probably because he has personal dirt on all the higher-ups that he'll leak if he doesn't get his way. In the behind the scenes, you can actually find one of these leaked videos here. Hi, Zero. And the reason why I post uh, this video here, I'm looking for a beautiful lady with a luxury and a busty body across the world. They're armed with high-powered rifles and shotguns that make the submachine guns the gang used look like literal nerf guns. Pressing the button to locate firearms, you can see just how many soldiers shang -Chi sent after you. If anything, it literally is a small army. Sorry, this went to shit. It's all I guess I screwed up. Let's just get the hell out of Shanghai. Fucking China. Ah, shit. Did I die? Getting outside the docks to the shipping yard, the only enemies you fight now are the Chinese military. There's no civilians that get caught in the crossfire. This is surgical. Everyone's already been evacuated, so it's just you two against everyone, minimizing any casualties. Singh's gang have either been called off or you've killed them all, entirely being replaced by shang -Chi's military. The commanding soldiers are always marked on screen because of how dangerous they are, carrying QJY-88 light machine guns that, if you manage to get your hands on one, are so devastating the audio and visual become completely nauseating. With muzzle flash and audio spikes, the camera has a problem keeping in level. It results in feeling like you have a literal minigun in your hands. And even though accuracy is king in this combat, as long as you keep the trigger held down, you'll eventually kill whatever you're aiming at, even if you go deaf in the process. Even being knocked down, Lynch will just one hand this 15 or so kilogram light machine gun like it's Rambo. Even better, because of how much ammo there is, if you can't hit an enemy, chances are you can just destroy the cover they're crouched behind. Escaping onto a cargo train, not even sure where it's heading, the train comes to a hole as Ken and Lynch are taken prisoner by the Chinese military. The cameraman himself even being forced to stop filming. When the filming resumes, the two are taken prisoner on a military helicopter, probably on their way to meet shang -Chi personally. I mean, it's a cool setup, but neither of them are restrained and they don't have any guns pointed at them. It took me ages to find someone that could translate that, by the way. You'd be amazed how many people know someone that understands Japanese and Korean, but never Chinese. We care about effort on the Parasynical channel. Bring me everyone. What do you mean everyone? EVERYONE! I especially like how they're all communicating on radios, despite no one having a headset. And Ken and Lynch also proceed to talk on radio for the rest of the mission, while having no audio equipment <laughs> at all. The entire level takes place in the hijacked helicopter, trying to get anywhere except here. This is the biggest view we've had of Shanghai. If anything, this rendition, it looks sick. The smog spread across the city. It should be a beautiful setting, finally out the slums and parking lots. But the overcast skies just make the city look depressing and meek. You have a light machine gun with infinite ammo, which sounds easy, but you're up against office blocks of soldiers and helicopters that will shred you in seconds. There is cover in the helicopter, but the longer you stay in cover, the more the helicopter will take damage, and the metal frames will start to fall off, fully exposing you. So you'll have to play extremely aggressively. Your health will regenerate, 
but the helicopters won't. I love this one part where it's two helicopters moving back and forth between Shanxi's tower, with possibly dozens of innocent civilians being caught in the crossfire of bullets and broken glass. It's horrific to watch, but it perfectly encapsulates how no one is safe. I also like how your MG has three bars to indicate, you know, three magazines, but the game just always automatically reloads after the first magazine is emptied. Yep, I, I really have to keep reminding myself that I am playing a bad game. <laughs> <laughs> After taking down what feels like an entire army, the helicopter eventually gives up, crashing in what looks like a film would do on a budget of $7, just shaking the camera. And the final frame before the loading screen is like just before the crash even happened. Again, like I love how much of a beautiful mess this game is. Lich. Yeah. Uh, it hurts. You okay? Yeah, I think so. Can you move? Lynch and Kane have landed in the worst place imaginable, Shang-Chi's tower. It's almost laughable how bad their luck is at this point. Like there's some kind of karmic justice constantly punishing them, only letting them escape because they haven't been hurt enough yet. You can see the cuts that Sing gave them earlier, bleeding through the fabric and bandages. Again, another detail that helps sell that they've really been on the run since the start of the game with no time to rest. You start off losing all your weapons, but that lasts about seven seconds because the game realizes the stealth mechanic is completely broken and you die in about two shots if you take someone hostage. You start on the rooftop and have to work your way into the building to get to an elevator to leave. And when you eventually find an elevator, it breaks. Of course it breaks. Nothing has gone right this whole game. Why, why would it start now? Even if you made it to the streets, Lynch pretty much summarizes that that would be a death sentence. And mingle. We're two white blood covered guys in China. I genuinely think if we got outside the tower into the financial district, they would have been gunned down instantly. By staying in the tower, they can keep playing the game just a little bit longer. You travel through most of the rooms that you shot up in the helicopter. These beautiful executive suites and bars annihilated by your gunfire. The broken windows casting outside the gray sky. If anything, it perfectly encapsulates how purgatory would look. There's nothing rewarding out there or in this building. And the enemies even use this against you by repelling into the broken windows. And what little is left untainted is quickly demolished by the last few helicopters sent in to take you down. Some helicopters even crashing into the building and survivors jumping out and instantly attacking you like some kind of mime car. Most sane people would cut their losses and evacuate, but nothing seems to be worse than angering shang -Chi. Some fights were so packed with soldiers I had to blind fire because I knew if I peeked for a second, I'd be instantly cut down. There's an achievement for getting a thousand kills globally in Kane and Lynch 2, and I got it about halfway through this mission. If anything, it's a reminder of how many people shang -Chi can throw at you. After this, the plan changes. There's no way you're going to make it out of this building alive. There's hundreds of floors to clear and each one more dangerous than the last. So instead, they try to find shang -Chi. I swear, Kane, he's going to wish he was dead when I get hold of him. If we find shang -Chi, stay calm. He killed Sue. And we shot his daughter. There's a code, Lynch. Okay. Okay. Look, we can use him, all right? You gotta trust me on this. Don't make it personal. Yeah, I'll try. Kane wants to use shang as leverage to get out unscathed. Making a deal with the devil is a dangerous thing, but at the minute, they're definitely in hell, so there's not many more options. The next couple areas have no enemies. They're just there to remind you of the destruction you've caused. Smoke building up in the hallways, employees who weren't involved in this war choking to death. It all sounds really meaningful and deep, but quickly ruined by this guy who just ragdolls. Making it into the executive wing of the building, we see bars and lounges bigger than the entire homes from the first level. Exhibits with taxidermied animals. It really shows the separation between the super elite and the normal civilians we saw in the suburbs at the start of the game. And finally, the pair confront shang -Chi. The man who's ruined their lives, seemingly on his own. You've killed every single man he has, or at least what he has available right now. His boardroom is destroyed, with glass shattered and burnt papers flying around, and bullet holes everywhere. But regardless of all this, and what you did to his daughter, he still wants to make you an offer. Oh, gentlemen. Yes, sir. Prison. Shit. Come on, boy. 
boys. Let's be civilized. You gotta be fucking shit. You're about Mr. Kane, I can use a man like you. Therefore, I make this offer. Mr. Lynch. Shit, Lynch! What was that? The fuck was that? Fuck, you believe it? That cutscene is probably one of my favorite cutscenes ever in a video game, and one of the main reasons I made this video. That sudden cut to black for effect is something I stole and reused in my Utopia outro montage. Lynch could never be trusted to keep his cool, but I think it's a catch-22. By killing him, he's angered the remaining forces more. But at the same time, could you really trust someone like that? Someone who's literally sent a thousand plus men after you. I feel he would have tortured Ken and Lynch far more than what Singh did as justice for his daughter. Or maybe he didn't care about his daughter and genuinely just wanted to work with them. We'll never know. I just love how a character is hyped up throughout the entire game as the most corrupt and terrifying man imaginable. This guy that everyone is afraid of, and he has less than 30 seconds of screen time. No boss health appearing or mocking you on a radio at every chapter. He just appears and then he's gone. Yet another casualty, and it makes the game feel so much more realistic in that regard. Even the cameraman quickly turns around to film Lynch, surprised that the conversation didn't go on any longer. The audio here is terrible and basically inaudible without subtitles but that's the point how could you ever expect to properly hear a conversation between three people hundreds of feet in the sky with the windows blown out but regardless of all that what's certain now is the pair need to get out of china because if they don't they'll just end up as another casualty like shang -Chi. This loading screen is different. Instead of Lynch speaking, it's only Kane. Voicemailing his daughter, Jenny, telling her that he's coming home and he's done with this life of crime. Uh, I'm sorry. I know we haven't spoken since, uh, you know. <clears throat> Look, I'm, uh, I'm coming home. I hope we can put the past behind us. I'm done with all this, baby. And I hope you can forgive me. But, sweetheart, if you don't see me, I, uh, I want you to know I love you. This near-death experience has made him realize how fragile life is. I think it's up to you to interpret if he's being honest or not, whether he'll slip into his old ways, or you could just look online and see if they made a third game. <laughs> Lamau. There are hangers over there. If Laser was telling the truth about the plane, that's where it's gotta be. The final level takes place at Shanghai Airport. It's incredibly different to all the previous back streets and office blocks. They even spent the rest of the budget animating planes landing on the runway that tanks my frame rate despite being on a 3090 Ti. Also, remember when I said stealth wasn't a thing? Well, I was tricked again thinking it was, starting off with silenced pistols. That was up until AI Lynch ran ahead and started one-handed firing at all of the enemies, killing none and alerting all of them. You've probably noticed as well that we're playing as Kane. The final level always has you play from his perspective. The entire reason you're here is because of the plane Glazer mentioned when he was pleading for his life. The plane is real, but when you go to it, it's been taken apart. And worst of all, that arms deal, the only reason you're here in the first place, is going ahead with the remnants of Glazer's squad. It just feels like mocking at this point, dangling everything in front of you the final moments before you get out of the country. The ironic thing is, you have no option to take the bags of money spread across the plane wing, but you can take as many weapons as you want. I think this is pretty good acknowledgement that money just isn't going to do anything here. God, that, that piece of shit can't fly! It's fucking junk! Might as well put a fucking bullet in our hands! Are you done? We'll find another plane. Ah, this was our fucking shot. It's an airport. Keep going. 
Kane is much more determined to escape than Lynch. He still has Jenny to get back to. Lynch has nothing, only being fueled by his bitterness to the people that took his girlfriend. Getting into the airport, you have to move through cargo. Again, inevitably having civilians in between the gunfire. Blowing up luggage cases the security are hiding behind. Half of these people probably aren't even shang -Si's men, but just airport security trying to protect innocent people. Problem is, there are no planes. No private jets anyway. So instead, they'll have to hijack a commercial airliner before it takes off. Running past security outside the cargo bay. Maybe you shoot some security, maybe some civilians on accident. It doesn't matter, as long as you make it to that plane. Police are set up in the airport terminal, hailing down gunfire on you, but you barely, just barely make it onto that plane, taking probably several hundred people as hostage. The plane takes off, leaving only the cameraman, who is shot by the police and falls to the ground, dead. And that's it. The, the game just ends as abruptly as that. There's no after credit scene. I mean, wh wh where'd you even go from there? Whatever country they'll land in will probably have an entire army waiting for them. If anything, they've only escaped the damage for as long as that plane's in the air. I also like as well how the last two enemies you kill in the game are literal dogs. You get it because you, you put the dogs to sleep and the game is called Sleeping Dogs. Wow, game theory. Hi, me's a writer. I can interpret literally anything. <laughs> Actually, if you want to know what happened to Kane and Lynch, IO's next game, Hitman Absolution, released two years later, has both Kane and Lynch in the game as NPCs, meaning canonically they somehow got back to America. Kane, you can blame for power cutting the jukebox, which breaks out into a huge fist fight, and Lynch is out in a shooting range where if you shoot all the gnomes around him, he gets the blame for it. You can even find Kane later on in the game in a prison cell writing to his daughter Jenny, apologizing for being a mercenary and all the pain he's caused, which is like, like the fifth time he's doing this, I think. Even IO are just completely aware how ridiculous this trope is. There's also an Easter egg where you can nuke Lynch, but that's not canon because it ends the game. I I, I don't know anymore. Looking back at the game, it feels like a fever dream. The visuals are janky, gameplay is janky. I mean, literally everything is janky, but Ken and Lynch Dog Days has this ugly beauty about it that I don't think I've ever found in any other game. And that should be it. There's no new game plus, no unlockables. There's not even any collectibles in the world to give you some kind of lore or anything to do. The game is unapologetic in that regard, and I love it for that, but there is extreme difficulty. <laughs> I saved this for after the campaign because it definitely deserves its own segment. It isn't unlocked by beating the game. You can start this difficulty as soon as you start the game. And I can't think of a better or worse way to play this game. It's terrible because you get shredded by anything more than a stray cough. <laughs> This means to survive, you'll have to push the game to its limits. And this shows all the flaws Kane and Lynch 2 fundamentally has. Teammates can take your cover and block your shots. Small arms not being able to hit the broadside of a barn, but shotguns acting like literal snipers. Your partner just feels like set dressing because everyone is shooting you and only you. I mean, the friendly AI on the base difficulty wasn't that competent, but sometimes they would save your life. But here, they just get bodied instantly. I streamed my entire playthrough of Extreme on Twitch, and you could see the hopes and dreams I had at the beginning and how I was a literal dribbling corpse by the end. It was streamed on Twitch, but uh, recently Twitch took away my partner, so I'm not actually on Twitch anymore. I stream everything on YouTube on my second channel. Changing perspective from left to right shoulder can sometimes have seconds of input delay, which is life or death on this mode. And Lynch's angry schizophrenic ramblings are pretty much null and void, because instead of darting from cover to cover quickly, dispatching enemies, you're sat behind the same piece of cover, clicking on an enemy 50 times, hoping that the RNG kicks in, and you get a lucky headshot. Mostly because the damage drop-off is so horrendous, anything outside of a headshot will never get you a kill. I even found out on this difficulty by testing every gameplay tactic to its limits. Their bullets don't actually come from the character's gun, but from the camera itself. So if you crouch beyond some cover without actually initiating cover, your shots would be more accurate and you'd never have to expose yourself, mowing down enemies by the cameraman essentially shooting everyone. By doing this, I entirely broke the game, but I felt like I had to. Imagine teaching yourself to not use the cover mechanics in a third-person cover shooter. 
That's the worst thing about this game I've realized. You are actually better off instead of hiding and cover and doing this and exposing yourself. You're better off just like going inside a wall and then just firing like this. So why did I say this is also one of the best ways to play the game? Because extreme difficulty is brutal, but only because enemies have the exact same firepower you do. When I was about to die, I take cover and usually blind fire to get some cheap and unfair headshots. Well, now the enemies do exactly that. People that blind fire on extreme difficulty are arguably more dangerous than anyone else in the game because there's no head to click onto. Every group you face is almost like another Kane and Lynch. Horrible, evil people that are killing you just to survive. I'm not saying this is The Last of Us 2 where every character would scream some kind of name as a cheap attempt to build empathy. Skylar! <laughs> But it's how brutal these enemies are that you kind of respect how they're just trying to survive as well. <laughs> don't you fucking touch me! I don't even think the game tweaks anything apart from multiplying enemy damage, but that's enough. There's an opening teaser video if you wait on the main menu long enough. And I think that perfectly encapsulates how unfair and brutal extreme difficulty is. The video is filmed from a camcorder's perspective, keeping in theme with the rest of the game. <laughs> Seen Kane after a heist has gone wrong, already shot, and all of his men dying around him. They try to take some of the cash, but get obliterated. Reminding me of dashes I'd make to get ammo for my gun, which would usually get me killed. Whoever's pursuing Kane is relentless, taking more bullets, eventually running out of ammo for his rifle, and switching to his pistol. We're not even sure if he kills anyone, eventually making it to an open field where he realizes he's half dead and no better off than before the heist. It's depressing and feels unrewarding, which is exactly how you'll feel beating this mode. I think only 3% of people on Steam have this achievement. Now, the game does have online co-op, but the reason I've left it so late into the video is because firstly, I have no friends apart from AI chatbots on Discord, and the multiplayer is even somehow an even more glitchy mess than the main game. <laughs> I'm convinced at the sub-basement floor of the Square Enix offices, you have a hamster running on a wheel, and that hamster is the only thing powering the Kane and Lynch 2 online servers. We've begun a co-op game, only for the game to crash as soon as we started, forcing us to desktop. <laughs> it crashed! Pushed. And it crashed! Ah! Then we launched again, only for the cutscene to not load, and instead showed the back of our heads in the torture room cutscene halfway into the game. What the f- I literally just saw our characters standing up. The problem is, with Kane and Lynch co-op, it has that issue first-person games have. By that I mean, if you get any first-person game, and then go into the console and make the game third-person, you'll see your character is just a janky mess skidding across the floor. This, combined with the worst netcode since Battlefield 2042, your co-op partner will skid around and look like a Russian aimbot, bizarrely aiming in the air only to kill everyone on screen. Oh my god. The game can't seem to cope with more than one person, so timed events don't even work properly. The guy we were chasing in the first level just ran through literal walls because we were catching up with him. Yeah, you can fire without having to aim. Oh my god. He clipped it! <laughs> the game actually can't keep up with how quick we're moving. On the rooftop, you can pretty much outrun the people you're chasing. I mean, it, it doesn't change anything. You can just do it. Oh, she just abandoned the fucking girl. The girl's like still behind. The girl's behind us. Like he just, he don't give a fuck. Throwing gas canisters, both players will instantly lock onto it. So usually your co-op partner will detonate the canister while it's in your hand. What the fuck did you do? Why'd you shoot it? Dude, I had no idea you had a fucking gas canister in your hand. Enemies don't fare much better either. I had a lot of instances where they'd just be stuck into a wall, completely helpless. Oh, that guy's just that guy's just stuck on the roof. Yep. yep. He's just floating in midair. Nice. Yep. It's almost like the devs were aware of these problems because at scripted points, you'll be knocked down as if the next area hasn't loaded yet. I especially like this part where I intentionally kill Glazer with a fire extinguisher and the game had so much of a delay, Kane didn't even acknowledge his death until several moments later. Fuck! Kane! <laughs> Glazer's dead! Is he dead? Glazer's gonna die! <laughs> also, I found out here that the devs coded Glazer to be killable, but the random driver you're with is completely invulnerable, and any damage only knocks him down for a couple seconds. Honestly, the only difference I can notice, when you wake up in the dumpster as Lynch, instead of making your way to Kane, a cutscene plays where you do it instead. Now, one thing I would not do is recommend playing the co-op on Extreme. Do we do Extreme? No. Please. Ah, yes. Extreme difficulty. If I get scraped by the arm on the concrete, I die.
Yes. If anything, it's harder than solo because when you get knocked down, you bleed out in about three seconds. You shot me? me. What? what? Give me up, give me up, give me up, give me up, give me up. You can mash E to slow down the timer, but the game usually doesn't even register this, so you just die anyway. Even though the entire game is only around four hours, we were both exhausted by the end of it. And when the game crashed for about the eighth time on the final mission, we just called it a day. The co-op is genuinely fun, <laughs> but only if you can put up with the equivalent of home Wi-Fi shared with around 800 people. Oh, this <laughs> and he just walks away as he downs me. <laughs> he just didn't fucking that care. That was actually the worst interaction I think I've seen. Multiplayer, on the other hand, is somehow even more unstable than co-op. At least in co-op, the Square Enix servers only have to put up with one other person connecting, but multiplayer goes up to 12. <laughs> So most matches don't even start without bricking someone's entire PC. And if you're lucky enough to connect to a game, it's essentially a collection of people skidding across the floor and running backwards from critical shortage of ADHD medication. The netcode is so laughably bad, most people just levitate across the map with no physical movement. And randomly, people's in-game voice won't move with their character, so the voice box will just be stuck at spawn. So you'll hear someone talk from miles away, even though their in-game model is right next to you. Oh, by the way, the mic quality is pristine. Like, think of the most low-quality Modern Warfare 2 lobby. I organized a couple matches with degenerates from the Parasynical Discord, link down in description. And I'm so happy to confirm that there was at least one person who had a mic so terrible, you could hear every single sound bit compressed five seconds later. Oh my god, the shitty mic! <laughs> I'm just hearing like an ambulance through someone's mic, man. There's three multiplayer modes, and each one follows the same plan of playing as a member of Glazer's gang before Ken and Lynch show up. At the start of each map, you'll reach a looting area where you have to take cash or valuables, and then make your way to an extraction vehicle, either a van or a helicopter, while fighting through hordes of gang members and police, both of which get you extra cash for killing them. Each round has more reinforcements, but there's a shop in between where you can buy better guns to defend yourself. But each game mode slightly tweaks how this run works. The first, Fragile Alliance, is the baseline game mode. But as the name implies, you can kill anyone on your team and loot the cash they've picked up for yourself. The only problem is this will instantly brand you a traitor. So everyone will know that you're not to be trusted and will gun you down on sight. It's also very specific about what brands you a traitor. If you shoot someone in the head, nearly killing them, the game thinks that that's an accident during a firefight, so there's no repercussion. But if you grab a friend on accident, making them a human shield, which does nothing and they can easily break out of, causing no damage, you can legally blow them away with an AK with no repercussion because the game has deemed them a traitor. This, this chicanery? Well, you, you can just fuck over other people by trying to kill them in this mode. Hey. I fucking knew it. Also, anyone that does die before extraction will respawn as a cop for a chance to get revenge. You'll instantly be able to tell who the human control cop is because a name is above their head, and they'll be the only cop in the entire match that can actually hit anyone, despite the fact that they're moving around like they're using their neighbor's Wi-Fi because they forgot to set a password. Oh, shit. The escape vehicle in all modes will pull up, stay there for five seconds, and then leave, only to come back every 30 seconds and repeat until the timer runs out. This is when tension peaks, because players that have worked together will maybe try to pop each other off to get some extra cash. My favorite getaway vehicle is the van, because the driver has the highest KD ratio of any game, mowing down cops and gangsters alike. Don't forget us! We're coming! <laughs> I even saw one occurrence where two of the last players were fighting each other for the remaining cash, and the van bravely broke up the argument by running them both over, killing them instantly. <laughs> 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 also, in any mode, when you get in an escape vehicle, you can be a good boy and ask them to wait an additional five seconds. Or you can be a complete piece of shit and give the driver half of your cut for them to take off immediately, ditching everyone. Overall, Fragile Alliance is... fine? <laughs> The main problem is it's too easy. The enemy AI has no idea what to do when it's tracking more than two people, so just freaks out missing every shot. And by the time dead squad mates turn into cops, the game is pretty much over. And there's no real reward for trying to screw over your friends because guns are dirt cheap and usually useless. And killing other players is usually impossible unless you're the only people left. Because of how bad the lag is, you'll always be killed by someone that looks like they're spin by. <laughs> One mechanic I really do like here, though, is how the game snitches on you if you have too much cash, with someone in your squad making a remark saying that you've got too much money. Fucking how rich you are. It doesn't actually put a target on your head, but it's a nice touch to make people think twice about killing you. 
Okay, cops and robbers. This is where things get interesting. The exact same scenario I explained before. Difference is now it's 12 players instead of eight. It's split between two teams. One team is Glazer's gang. The other team is Shanghai's finest trying to recover the money for themselves. I love how it shows even though the police are a force of good with civilians running towards them for safety. In reality, they're just as corrupt as Glazer's squad, having one-liners when they pocket the cash for themselves. <laughs> This is a lot more chaotic and honestly, really hard. You'll switch from Glazer's squad to cops each round so everyone gets a chance. As a cop, you'll probably want to try and buy a rifle and sit back to stop anyone from pushing forward. Because if you get into a close quarters fight, the Square Enix server will probably have a stroke. Glazer's squad will still try to escape via chopper or van. But this time, you can destroy both of them, which kills everyone inside until another one arrives. Nice job! Yeah! Oh, fucking so you'll have to make the active choice of getting in a vehicle and chancing it or holding off until another vehicle arrives with restored health. But that means you'll have to deal with more cops. Neither side has better equipment or health. Both sides buy from the same shop at the start of each round. And that's what makes this mode hard because it's really balanced, especially with how tanky everyone is on this mode. You'll usually have to empty a whole magazine into someone just to down them and then switch to your sidearm to finish them off. The number of times I got knocked down and finished someone with the last couple bullets in my magazine barely surviving it reminded me of how brutal extreme difficulty was and the grimy camcorder aesthetic really accommodates that the only forgiving aspect is no matter what team you are you respawn five seconds after you die usually because the lag is so bad you'll be shot by someone only for it to register the death about five minutes later go, go, go. Fuck. One of the saddest things I saw in this game mode was my entire squad escaping a map, except one guy that went AFK. And as soon as he came back, the helicopter already left and he was swarmed by Chinese cops and pretty much died instantly. Oh, poor fucking polio, man. He's like completely on his own. No. <laughs> oh, poor fucking guy. And finally, undercover cop. Now, this is one of the most fundamentally broken game modes, but it's probably my favorite. It's more similar to Fragile Alliance, eight players trying to get cash to the end of the level and they can still betray each other. But the twist is one person each round is an undercover cop that has to stop the heist entirely. Kind of like Trouble in Terrorist Town, but the traitor is a good guy. It's broken because anyone who's the undercover cop is instantly screwed. If you kill someone in Glazer's squad, you'll not mark the traitor, but it doesn't matter because usually every squad will stick together like glue and separating them to kill each other is pretty much impossible. I've tried taking on multiple unaware where people, but the health pool is too big. It, it just doesn't work. <laughs> Again! The problem is anything you do that breaks character instantly snitches you to everyone on your team. If you accidentally shoot a single cop, gang member, or civilian, the entire team will be told instantly that you're the undercover cop with a huge blue neon sign flashing above your head. So if Glazer's squad are stacked together and you can't attack any NPCs, the only thing you can really do is hope that the gang turns on each other and you take advantage of that because you never really have another opportunity. Trouble in Terrorist Town had items you could buy to help the traitor and rounds were fairly long, but these are choke point maps that last like four minutes each round. Now, this definitely does sound like the weakest mode by far, but it's my favorite because it genuinely made me second guess every character's actions, physically using the camera to look behind my shoulder in case someone wanted to, you know, quickly cap me. Keep in mind, people can still be traitors here and not be the undercover cop. So that adds a third layer onto the anxiety. Just because the undercover cop has been found and killed doesn't mean people still won't turn on you later on in the game. On one map, we reached the ending only for me to notice someone shoot another player unprovoked. He wasn't marked as a traitor for doing it, so I assumed he was the undercover cop and I tried to kill him. Only for someone behind me to mistake me for being the cop and knocked me down to the ground. I didn't have any time to explain my case because I was too panicked and I was slightly quicker and killed him. After getting up, I asked the guy I saved this. <laughs> You're not a cop, right? Please tell me you're not a cop, man. I shot foxes and then the other fucking guy jumped me. I think they were the, the last two fucking cops. We barely survived and escaped. It was confusing and frantic, but I loved it. And that's a moment I'll always remember from this game.
Just over 10 days after the game launched, it had some multiplayer DLC called Doggy Bag, which added some new guns, maps, and character customization. I couldn't play these maps with anyone because, you know, who's going to get DLC for a 12-year-old game that has an average player count of three people a day? The maps included a high-rise level, which was essentially Shang Tsi's tower in the campaign, but at night. A dock map and a radio tower, both of which are fine. I mean, yeah, just whatever. The weapons added in the DLC pretty much break any kind of progression because getting better weapons is tied directly to your character's rank. But as soon as you buy this DLC, some of the most overpowered weapons are available instantly. So the game is literally pay to win. And the customization? Well, you can never pick your character, so I assumed it would add that option. But nope. All you do is go into the options and now check a box if your character has a mask or not. And the mask is chosen at complete random. That's it. Relax. What just happened? What just happened? Stop fucking kill ya! This woman, you stay the fuck away. Shanksy is not gonna stop. There definitely will never be another Ken and Lynch installment, especially from how mediocre the reviews both games had. The fact they undersold, and most importantly, IO lost the rights when Square Enix dropped them, forcing them to go independent. They kept the Hitman IP, which is great. I love Hitman. Well, like m most of them, anyway. But I'd still love to imagine a world where Ken and Lynch 3 came out, and it retained this shaky handheld cam aesthetic that the second game had. So yeah, that's Ken and Lynch 2, Dog Days. <laughs> I know it's been me rambling about a game that literally no one's heard about or cares about, but it's been living rent-free in my head for a while now, and, you know, I just wanted to put it out on video because that helps me move on to something else. I love the artistic direction they took here. If anything, this game reminds me a lot of Far Cry 2. There's a lot of things in this game that doesn't work, and it's overly bloated and encumbered, but the things that work really do work. Overall, I'd give Dog Days probably four antipsychotics out of ten, but for the aesthetic choices alone, I'd bump it to a solid seven. It's definitely worth at least one playthrough. Oh,